You can spend, you can save What is the right thing to do? Federal benefits Thrift savings plans too You can save your own way Welcome to the Plan Your Federal Retirement Podcast. I'm your co-host, Micah Shalansky. And with me, as usual, our back, I should say, is the amazing Tammy Flanagan. Tammy, how's it going? I'm doing great, Micah. I'm so glad to be back. And I'm so glad I got signed in. This technology today has really been <laughs> giving, me a, giving me a hard time. But I'm here and clear, and I think we're good to go. I'm excited. I'm anxious to hear what people are wanting to know about and anxious to share some information yeah. that we've been talking about because we've had some pretty interesting situations lately. We really have. I'm excited to jump into it too. Uh, if you're happy to not be listening to this while it's live, this is a live podcast, which we're excited about. We've got a lot of great feedback. We have a couple hundred people signed up for this, which is wonderful. And one of the reasons Tammy and I wanted to do more of the live podcast and, and work with us, give us some good comments and feedback. We really would appreciate it. What do you like? What things can we improve? Our goal, again, is to help transform the federal employee's retirement. We're going to talk about some misinformation that is so costly and so painful to federal employees. And we don't want you in that camp. We want you to know your benefits, to understand your benefits, and to make a transition to the next chapter of your life and not to have to worry. It says, oh, crap. OPM canceled my health insurance. Oh, no, yeah, we're about to talk about how that story is going down right now, right? Um, we want you to sail into retirement with joy and excitement, not fear of the unknown. So give us some feedback, what you like about the pod. Share this message. Let's get it out there. Again, uh, a big goal, helping another million federal employees with their retirement. So pretty excited about that. Tammy, anything else you want to add in on there? No, I think that, um, yeah, that old saying goes, you expect the best and prepare for the worst. It really applies to retirement planning, especially during this period of transition when we're putting in our application, filling out the paperwork, and keeping our fingers crossed that everything goes smoothly. But there are things we can do. There are things we can do to make sure that we have as smooth of a transition as possible. Amen. All right. So, Tammy, let's kind of jump into this just a little bit and let's kind of go through some of the issues we see. I know the, the big thing we wanted to talk about was securing your retirement with TSP, right? Boy, what does that even mean? That's a big topic and we're not going to be able to get to it all. But we wanted to give you some good highlights of things to think about. But Tammy and I were talking kind of pregame about some other things we're seeing coming down the pike with OPM, with HR, that I think you know warrants us taking a little bit of time and chatting about that. And there's two kind of big issues we're running into right now. The first one, Tammy, if I had to encapsulate it, I would really say it's misinformation, completely wrong information retirees are getting from HR that's causing irreparable damage to their retirement benefits. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. And I would even say inadequate information because the rules for what we're about to talk about are not clear. Yes. It proves to me they're not clear because we've seen this time and time again. I've gone through at least four clients. I know you've dealt with this with several of your clients. So if it's happening this frequently, it's not the client's fault. It's the fact that the instructions aren't clear. It's it's yeah. obvious. And so what are we talking about? What is this? <laughs> we got everybody's <laughs> bated breath. They're wanting to know, what, what can I do? What's happening? All right. So a couple of things. We're going to talk about real quickly some things on the retirement application. Now, a lot of things on the retirement application, it's okay on, right? That there's some things we can fix on there. There's not irreversible decisions that you're making when you're filling it out, except there are some and they're not called out any differently. And that's what's causing an issue. And so one thing that we're seeing with clients that choose to do a postponed retirement, which to me is a phenomenal benefit of federal employees. They get to have at least 10 years of federal service. They've met their MRA. 
they want to transition to something else, but they want to come back for that golden benefit you all have, which is that health insurance. They want to come back and tap into that health insurance and keep having the government pay for the vast majority of it for the rest of their life. And so there's a way you can file for a postponed retirement. And so you're delaying your benefits, then you're getting your pension, you're getting your health insurance turned back on, which is great. But if you make this one mistake, which is again, confusing on the form, you're going to forego that benefit. And it has to do with putting the right date for when your benefits start. And the reason we're bringing this up is we're hearing, again, multiple cases. We got one with a, a client, one of our advisors is working with. It's a quarter million dollar mistake, plus they're losing health insurance potentially because the wrong information was put in there. So Tammy, shed some light on what's going on there. I never realized this problem until just recently where it's been happening. Because when I teach about postponed retirements in class, here's what I say. I'll say, okay, for those of you who are at your MRA, which for many of our listeners is 57 years old, who uh -huh. don't have 30 years of service, but they got more than 10, you have an opportunity to retire with an immediate retirement, which means you can have your health insurance for the rest of your life. The problem is when you have less than 30 years and more than 10, and you take that at age 57, you're facing a 25% age penalty. So this is where the postpone comes in. So if you got 20 years or more, you could postpone that application, meaning you're basically going to resign from your agency and you're on your own. Here's where the mistake problem comes because now nobody's looking over your shoulder. Nobody's double checking what you're doing. You have this deferred postponed application to fill out. And if you have 20 years of service, but less than 30, you can file that application at age 60 and collect not only your retirement with no reduction, but you can reinstate your health insurance. So what date do you put on the application? And for those who have more than 10, but less than 20, now you gotta wait till you're 62 to have no age reduction. But again, what date do you put on the application? Well, if you're gonna do this at age 62, it's critical, it's absolutely critical that you make that effective date the month of your 62nd birthday, but before you turn 62. So if I'm 62 on November 15th, my effective date's gonna be November 1st, not December 1st. Because if I put December 1st as my effective date, that is no longer a postponed retirement, that's now a deferred retirement. And as most people know, a deferred retirement does not convey health benefits. Yes. That was the whole idea of this retirement was to have health insurance. And now just by putting a date that was two weeks to the wrong side of my birthday, I forfeited the benefit that I've worked so hard to get. And we're seeing this time and time again. And, and Tammy, I'm going to say, I understand the federal employee because the entire time you're, you're thinking about retirement, you are told your retirement begins the first of the following month after you retire. That's right. Right. So in your mind, it's the first of the following month, but that's an immediate retirement. That's not a postponed retirement. And so you're in this mindset, which I, I get, right? And then you read the forms and the forms aren't clear on how to put a date. You're like, hey, the first of the following, it's really no big of a deal. I'll put it for the next month. You sign off on it and you just gave away a, a massive, massive benefit. Yeah, and it seems so far that there's very little recourse. That's mm -hmm. the sad thing. This is where you were saying, Micah, that sometimes by putting one little thing wrong on that application, you're doing irreparable damage. So the only thing we can do at this point is to warn employees who are planning to do this very thing to read that instruction portion of that application 10 times before you put the date down. Make sure you understand what it's saying. Because to me, there should be a warning. There should be a big red flag saying, if you do this yeah. wrong, you're not going to have the ability to reinstate your health insurance. There is no such warning. They don't even link the entitlement to health insurance to the date. They just say, here's the date you want to put down. They don't say why it's so important. And so therefore, you figure, okay, I'll pick a date. You know, I even see people that wait till they're 64. And then they want to go back to 62 and claim the benefit. We can't do that. Right. You have to do it right then and there if you want to reinstate that health insurance. You cannot delay it. Tammy, I got a I got a noodle baker for you here, and I'm sorry I'm going to throw you on the spot on a live podcast here. <laughs> um, and we're still figuring this this out a little bit, dealing with OPM and the correction of this because this is a relatively new issue and having to fix these things with OPM. But if someone's birth date is the first and they turn 62 on December 1st, and their birth date's the first, what date do you put down on the application? 
So my birthday, my birthday is the first of the month, so I better know this one, right? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> huh, so if my birthday was on the first and I want to avoid the age reduction, I want to reinstate my health insurance, I can't make it effective the first of the next month. I've got to make it effective the, the day I turn 62. The day you turn 62. That's what I would think as well. I would say, don't take this advice on the pod. I'd want to look no. into it a little bit more. Yeah. Um, you know, or you would do it the month before. This would be a hard part. Now, it, it's something to add to this that makes it challenging is we can't get clarification from OPM right now. I, I know we've been asking for it um, in some official capacity to find out exactly what the rules are because we're also getting different answers from different people that process this retirement application and HRs are giving different information. So again, not trying to dump this whole thing on you guys on retirement, but this is how important understanding the rules are. And there's so many rules you need to be aware of. And when we get into TSP, by the way, we can see several of these same things with TSP that there's irreversible mistakes that are happening. So we really got to be careful of this. Yeah, you, you do. And I think if you learn nothing else from this, it's take your time, keep a yes. copy of everything that you do and read those instructions. If you don't understand them, call somebody who does because it's critical. I mean, like I said, we've seen some heartbreaking situations, you know, with this MRA plus 10 has been one example. And then we were talking about some other ones with survivor benefits that are even almost more heartbreaking. Okay. So on, on that note, there's our OPM update. <laughs> Sorry about that. There's a lot of stuff that's happening. Be really confident in what you have there. Get a second set of eyes that are looking at this that make sure that you're there. All right, Tammy, on that note, I know we spent a little bit of time on that. You want to transition? Let's talk about some TSP stuff. Sure. Yeah. Like that's a little happier business, right? Money about money. <laughs> In fact, I just had a client who had 1.375 million wow. in a thrift. And because him and his wife have spent their whole career, he's been in the government 33 years. He's only 55 and he's law enforcement. Wow. So he can retire at age 55 with more, a thousand dollars a month more than he brings home in his paycheck. Why is that? Because he's maxing out his thrift. He mm -hmm. stayed aggressive in his thrift in the investment, and him and his wife lived within their means. In fact, not only do they have all that money in the thrift, but every month they set aside an extra $2,000 just in a savings account in the bank. So the key to all of this retirement planning is live within your means. That used to be an easy thing to do. Right. But it seems to be a big challenge for many people. You know, Tammy, one of the things that I know you know this, right? But but I love about saving is saving has a two-prong effect. People always focus on the first thing. They say, hey, if I put money in my TSP, it's going to grow. It's going to do this other stuff, et cetera. But sometimes they get closer to retirement. They're like, well, why put money in my TSP? Because you know it doesn't have that much time to grow. Well, let's think about the second effect that saving money has. You're not spending it, that's right? right. <laughs> and that's a huge one. So yep. I'm not increasing my standard of living. I'm not blowing that money on a weekly basis. So that second part of the savings by not increasing your spending, that's why people get to retire comfortably in their 50s, right? They live within their means. They've saved a lot. Now they've designed income to replace their current standard of living. None of this BS that I need 80% of what I was living on or 60%. No, no, no. 100% of what you're spending now is what you need to be focused on replacing into retirement. Yeah, it'd be nice to have a little extra so you can have some fun too. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, you're going to have your 60 hours a week more to spend it. <laughs> <laughs> so Tammy, let's talk about that, right? Uh, now, again, we're going to speak in, in a very broad brush about things, right? This is just a, a live podcast out on YouTube and Apple. Uh, and it's great to give you guys ideas and how you implement this really matters. So this, of course, isn't recommendations, but have you thought about how much can you safely withdraw from your TSP and never outlive your money? And it's kind of a good question, Tammy. I've heard of ranges and percentage and dollar amounts. What are, what are things you've heard? Yeah, well, the one I always think about is the one that came about, I guess it was maybe in the 70s, the 4% rule, which sometimes mm -hmm. is converted to a 3% rule. And, you know, that's easy to follow, right? If nothing else, it's an easy rule. Because the way I understand it, if you, let's use 3%. If I take out 3% of my balance this year, then next year, all I'm going to do is add a cost of living adjustment to that amount. And every year thereafter, do the same thing. And as long as I'm staying invested, not 100% G fund, but I'm invested, you know, across the broad market of investments, I should be okay. Is that true, Mike? Oh, you've seen this play out. 
Yeah, we've seen this play out for a very long time, right? With retirees. Now, the key is that latter part of what you said, what's your investment strategy? So if you're going to take a 3%, a 4%, even a 5% distribution, which you can do as long as, this is the caveat, as long as you have an investment plan that's going to make up for that, right? And then I need a plan that says when, not if, when the market goes down in value, what are we going to do? What's our plan? How are we going to take money out? When, like right now, the market's been really good, right? You've been making a lot of money. What's your plan to not be greedy? And how do we put money on the side? So this, and making sure it's not emotional decision-making, this is what blows up retirees is they say, hey, I'm I'm getting to retirement age and you know what? I'm going to retire this next year. So I'm going to move all of my money to the G fund. Well, rewind the clock 12 months and, and people have done this. You gave up a tremendous gains because we moved all of our money to the G fund. Now, that's not necessarily a bad move, but was it an intentional move? And again, if we move all of our money to the G fund and it's paying a, a like 4% and change, I didn't look today, but 4% and change, it's a good rate. But is that really enough to outpace inflation and to be able to take withdrawals for the rest of your life? Probably not. No. And we see so many people who are moving everything to the G fund because they're retiring at age 60. Right. It's like, I don't know about you, Micah, but I know I'm already past age 60 and I got a time horizon. I think that still goes out a couple of decades, I'm hoping. Amen. Or longer, right? <laughs> and and longer. we want this to be a, a good aspect of your life. And so this is a, a question that we always get is it's not when am I going to retire? The investment question in my world is when are you going to use the money? Any money you anticipate using in the next five years doesn't belong invested in the stock market. And we all know why. 2008, 9, 10, <laughs> 11, 12. It took about five years to get back to even when the market fell. And so if we use this as a lens, it says, okay, if I'm going to spend money, right? And if I get, take this example, 1.3 million in the TSP, which is, oh my gosh, fantastic. What great work. Hopefully the plan is that we're going to blow all 1.3 million in the next five years, right? Hopefully not. Not this couple. They're very conservative. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, how much of that 1.3 are we going to spend in the next five years? And maybe that should be on the sidelines. Right? I can make an argument for the G fund, some other options as well. But that means the opposite of that. Maybe I should be looking at a longer term horizon with the rest of the money to allow that money to grow. Again, what got you here, your savings plan, your accumulation, which got you to the point of retirement is not the same plan we need in retirement when we're taking money out. We got to look at it differently. How many times have you sat down with a financial professional who claimed to know your federal employee benefits, but in the end really couldn't answer your questions? That won't happen at planyourfederalretirement.com. We specialize in working with federal employees across the United States on understanding how their unique benefits tie into their greater financial plan. We collaborate with the industry's top experts like Tammy Flanagan in order to come up with a financial plan that makes the most sense for federal employees who want to maximize their benefits. And because we've been in business for over 40 years, we also have the confidence to tell you when we don't know the answer to something. And when and if that happens, we don't throw up our hands and say, we just don't know. Instead, we start researching and looking through our network and talking to other federal employee benefits experts to find an answer that is helpful for you as a federal employee. If you want to meet with one of our federal employee benefit experts, jump online to planyourfederalretirement.com and see if a one-on-one consultation is correct for you. Isn't it time to take the guesswork out of planning for your federal retirement? Yeah. In this couple, good question he asked me. And of course, I advised him to find a financial advisor. But the question was, you know, if he has, I think it's 20% in G and 80% in the CS&I funds, how can he just take money out of the G fund from the thrift? Yeah. So, and I told him, I said, the only way that I know of would be to move some money completely out of the thrift plan that he's going to use for his spending and then leave his investment in the thrift and kind of replenish that kind of like that bucket strategy you talk about sometimes. Yes, ma'am. But I know enough about it to be dangerous. So I told him, get some professional help. <laughs> to me, that's not really a do it yourself unless you know what you're doing. You got to be really careful, right? Back to the irreversible decisions. You know, there's some things when you're filling out your TSP form, you got to be really careful what boxes you check. You may get something you asked for, but you didn't want, and it might be irreversible. Hey, what TSP form? Oh, well, forgive me. You're online, (laughs) a TSP form you fill out. 
it's still a form. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we used to say, get the TSP-70 and we can walk you through it, but there is no form to look at anymore, which is unfortunate because there's no way to preview that with a client or even for the client themselves to figure out, am I doing this right? Am I making the right choices? Because they only feed you the information that they want you to see. And so Tammy, one of the things we do with all of our clients is we really encourage our clients to say, look, I know you're smart. I know you're really good. Please don't take this in assault. But I'd really appreciate if you didn't help us too much, allow us to help you, right? We do a screen share with our clients before they take money out of the TSP and say, hey, let's do it together. Let's explain what these options are. Let's go through this thing because you can get click happy. You can think you're going down a path and end up giving all of your money to Snoopy and MetLife. Uh -huh. And now all of a sudden, there's no undo button on that. And, and you think that it says, oh my gosh, Mike, it can't be that easy. But Tammy, it is that easy. It is. Yeah, and what you're talking about, Mike, is the difference between electing installment payments over my life expectancy versus electing a TSP life annuity. And if you didn't know the difference, you'd think, oh, isn't that the same thing? No. Right. Totally different. Totally different. Yeah, you're right. It's very easy to make that type of a quick error that can be irreversible. So let's get back to your kind of previous comment about, you know, if you have an 80 20 allocation. So that example that you gave, it says, hey, I only want to take money out of my G fund, which is a solid plan. I, I love that thought, right? But the only problem with it is how do you do it? And the TSP, this is where we come in and say the TSP is excellent, I think, in, one, in two things it has low fees, which are fantastic, and it has limited investment options, and they're all good, right? Yeah. There's different times to use them, but they're all good those five funds do an excellent job over time. So that's what the TSP does really well. And then there's two things that TSP does not do well. In my world, that's distribution planning and tax planning. Those are things we can't control inside of the TSP that when it comes to retirement, we need to ask some tough questions and be like, okay, let's take, you know, let's call this guy Bob and Sue, right? And so, you know, Bob's getting ready to retire. He says, hey, I got 20% in the G, how do I take it out? And the answer is you cannot, right? You yeah. can't unless we do a transfer of some or all of that money to an IRA. And now I have two different pots. Maybe I leave some, and that's what I like for people under 59 and a half, especially. Yeah. Let's leave the G fund money, the money you need to take out and spend, let's leave that in the TSP. Mm -hmm. Let's transfer out the balance of the money to an IRA. And that's your growth fund now. Your IRA becomes your growth money, the CS&I, however it's invested. The TSP is that G fund. We get to pull our income out of there I don't worry about a 10% premature distribution penalty because it's inside from the TSP, which is beautiful. The G fund is guaranteed at, well, it's guaranteed never to lose money. Currently, it's paying 4% plus, which is a great rate for a money market. That works really well. And Tammy, as you know, I think uh, something a lot of people forget is that in even in retirement, I can take my IRA money and transfer it back into my TSP and refill that distribution pot um, every year or every couple of years as needed. That's right. And I guess the key to that is knowing when do I move the money back into the stock market? Yes. You know, does this go back to the old sell high, buy low theory? You know, <laughs> I go back to the don't be greedy theory, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's what we're telling of our clients right now, right? The markets have been phenomenal. They've made a lot of money. I don't think it's impending doom. I don't think the world's collapsing tomorrow. You know, like none of those things, but it's it's common sense. It's saying, hey, we've made so much money in the last 12 months. Let's refill, Tammy, you talked about it before, our buckets, right? Our cash bucket, our income bucket. We're taking money out of growth. We're selling out and saying, hey, what money do we need in the next five years? And let's make sure it's in a safe place that we can take it out. That's right. just good planning. And if the market goes down, you're covered. If the yep. market goes up, you're also covered. Yeah, so, so you want to always have enough in there. You're saying five years. So if the market did take a downturn, we're not scrambling to try to get money right away because we still have five years to recover from that downturn. You bet. And, and downturns the extreme, right? We could go back, you know, 30% corrections are what I'm saying is, is normal, right? Seeing your the C fund move 30%. Yeah, look at COVID, look at 2018, look at the multiple times, right? Yeah. The TSP moves. Now that doesn't make it bad, that's just how the investment works. Mm -hmm. And so we got to make sure we're separating out my longer term investments, five plus years, from my shorter term needs, less than five years. And I got to make sure that that money is not moving up and down by 30%. Right. That when I want my monthly cash flow of a thousand bucks a month, 
I don't want that to be 700 one month or 1300 <laughs> the next. I want a thousand a month. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And then you got to figure out you can pay tax on it too. So this is why you said put the money I'm spending in cash in the thrift, especially if I'm under 59 and a half, because if I start pulling money out of my IRA to spend, I got to pay not only tax, but a penalty if I'm under 59 and a half. So that was, I like that key piece of advice there. We kind of went over it quickly, but you got to remember that IRAs don't have the same tax rules as the TSP when it comes to distributions. You bet. And so one of the things that I love to do, one of the planning tools we use, Tammy, and I know you've seen this, is what we call our retirement income timeline. And that's where we kind of draw out the next 10 years, where's your income going to come from? And we want to put key ages on there, right? Now, how does this retain to the TSP? Pretty directly. If I'm retiring at my MRA, right? Well, law enforcement may be sooner in a non-special provisions, then let's call it MRA at 57. Right. I need to know how am I going to access money before 59 and a half? What happens after 59 and a half? Then, oh, by the way, at 62, my pension drops for some reason, right? There's some special, you know, that special annuity supplement turns into a pumpkin. And now all of a sudden my pension drops every month. Where's that extra money going to come from? That's right. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. It's almost like putting a puzzle together and figure out which piece fits where. And everybody's puzzle has a little different size of pieces. I love that. You know, for some of us, the TSP is the biggest piece of that puzzle. For others, it's the first basic benefit. You know, for some, it's equal. You, know, you got an equal piece coming from social security and equal piece coming from thrift. So, you know, try to keep it simple, but use some basic foundational rules because that can really make a difference into your longevity risk and also making sure you have the income that you need. Yeah. And that's that, that looking that 10 years down, right? It's, it's fun to say, hey, let's build a 30, 40 year plan, et cetera. That gets a little too big. It's a little too many numbers out there. With all of my clients, I can say, let's look at our next 10 years and let's make sure we have a solid plan for that. Yes, we should talk about 20, 30, 40. I'm all about that. But it starts with 10. And let's look and see what that looks like. Yeah, get through the first 10 and then you got the transition period over with. And then you have a system, right? You got a system in place. Yes. Tammy, before we get kind of too far down this, I want to talk a little bit more about distribution rules, right? And the TSP. So again, one of the things I said it doesn't do well is tax planning. Now, you could be saying, hey, Micah, I got the Roth TSP and you like Roth. So isn't that a good thing? And I think it's great. I love the Roth TSP, right? For the right people, it's a good fit. But Tammy, we're still a little, I'm going to say restricted in our distributions. So if I wanted to pull money out of the TSP, you know, good news is I have a little more flexibility between choosing where it comes from, from pre-tax versus Roth, but not so much from the investment. So would you walk us through how that works? Whenever you're taking distributions, you can choose if I want them to come from the Roth versus traditional. That's a good thing. That's a fairly recent change. Mm -hmm. But what some people I've seen are doing is they're separating that Roth money, maybe moving that out to a Roth IRA so that all I have left in my thrift plan is the pre-tax money, the traditional money, as they call it. And then when it comes time to take those distributions, the only problem is I'm still having to take them pro rata. So if I'm 80% C fund and 20% G fund and I take out $4,000 a month, I'm going to take only 20% of that or whatever, $800 out of the G and the rest of it's coming out of C. So this is where you have to maybe consider moving some of that money to an IRA to help you manage the tax planning, manage the volatility of the investment, and still keep it invested. Because, you know, like everybody should know by now, you can't stop investing just because you've stopped working. A hundred percent, right? And again, we got to look at the, what's the power of the Roth IRA? The power of the Roth is tax-free growth, but we got to meet some qualifications to get there, right? We got to have it for five years and be 59 and a half and older, right? In order to start taking that money out. And so that means when I'm looking at clients with Roths and I'm looking at their, their traditional, their pre-tax money, t and &E, but I'm looking at their Roth money, I have a different investment plan for each of those because it still goes back to my five-year rule. Am I planning on spending my Roth money in the next five years? Yes or no? If no, that money should be focused in long-term investments probably. That's what I should be thinking about on the investment side. Okay, well, I can't do that inside the TSP because of their proportionate investment options. So it's something to consider. Again, I'm not trying to rag on the TSP. Know what your options are 
And what's the best plan for you? I love that analogy that each person is a unique puzzle piece, right? right? And you're trying to put the puzzle together. So that means just because Frank is doing something doesn't mean Sue should do it. doesn't mean Bob should do it. You have the same tools, but everyone's shape is a little different in how it comes together. Yeah. And even like, I remember distinctly one time I had a person who I was talking to and she was high level younger person. She was like a grade 14 in Washington, DC, a gangbuster and moving up the career ladder. And she had a ton of money in her thrift and she was doing really well. And her favorite aunt, who also worked for the government out in Iowa, was almost heartbroken after she heard of her niece's good news because she said, I'm so happy for you. I'm so glad you had that money. She says, but I'm older than you and I don't even have a fraction of what you have in my TSP. And I had to really calm her down to say, that's okay. Yeah. Because... You make less money. You live on less money. You're in Iowa, not in Washington, D.C. Right. And you've been living on this amount of money. And if you don't understand this, another important part of the puzzle is that Social Security replaces more of your income at a $40,000 salary than it's going to replace for your niece's $140,000 salary. So she has to save more to get enough money to support her lifestyle in retirement. You don't necessarily have to put 30000 a year in your thrift. So I think it, it's some piece of comfort to know that not everybody has to save a million dollars, you know, because I know some of our listeners are saying, who in the heck has $1.3 million? I sure don't. So, you know, that's okay, because if you put your puzzle together and you have enough to pay your bills between FERS and Social Security, then your TSP is icing on the cake. It's not necessarily going to be your bread and butter that's going to pay your bills. And and Tammy, I love that. I got clients, and I know you do on both sides of the spectrum, clients that really need their TSP money. And I got clients that have plenty of pension and social security. They don't need their TSP. And not one is good, not one is bad. I love what you said. Know your goals, right? This is about you and your retirement. Your TSP is about your TSP, not mine, not Tammy's, not somebody else's. It's about your TSP. Is it designed to meet your retirement goals? That's the only benchmark you should be going after. I tell my clients, I don't care what the S&P did or the Dow or the NASDAQ or Bitcoin or gold, (laughs) right? Are they on track for their retirement? That's what you need to be shooting for. And it's hard to step back and look at that, but that's so critical to make sure you're set up for success. Yeah, and it also comes down to whenever you're looking at your neighbor who gets to retire at 57 and you're thinking, I'm 62 and I still can't retire. Well, that's okay because, you know, we can do other things to help you get prepared for whenever that comes. But there's nothing worse than somebody retiring and realizing they shouldn't have. Yeah. You know, that, boy, if I could have just worked another three years, I could have changed this whole situation. So, you know, be prepared, do some planning, understand the rules. And if you don't, you know, get someone who does to help you because your neighbor is probably not the expert. Your um, coworker is probably not going to be able to help you. It is. It's a, it's a puzzle to put together for each person. Yeah. Perfect. Well, Tammy, uh, the, you know, as usual, we never run out of content to think about. We still didn't get over half the stuff on the list because there's so much information here. It's almost like we do this every single day and get excited talking about it. So let's end with some good action items for our listeners. This podcast is about you being able to take this information this next week and make improvements in your life. So I'll kick it off and Tammy, I'm going to forgive me. I'm going to steal one of yours that you said, but number one, what are your retirement goals? And if you don't have them written down, you don't have goals. I didn't say share them with the world, but you need to have it written down. What dates do you want to retire? How much money do you want to spend a month in retirement, right? If you don't have any, those are two really good ones to start with. Yeah, I'd say get some education. I mean, this, these podcasts are great. We give a lot of useful tips and help, but this isn't the end of it. You've got to do some homework. You've got to understand how these things work. The TSP has free training on their website. You can sign up for online classes. There's one for pre-retirement. It's two and a half hours long. You might learn three or four things there that will make a difference in your future. Your agency might be offering some type of an online training class, or you might be able to go to the hotel down the street where someone is going to provide some training. So get that education. It's critical. I love it. Last action I'm going to say is get a tax plan in place. This is so critical. In two years, now who knows what's going to happen with Congress, but at least in two years, 
Under current law, your taxes will more than likely be higher in two years than they are today. So what's the plan in the future? A myth that so many of us fall into, when I retire, my taxes will be less. That is not true unless you do something about it today. Right. So make sure you know this. This could be your largest expense you're going to have. It's not healthcare because you have great healthcare. You have great healthcare insurance, et cetera. The largest expense you're going to have in retirement is more than likely taxes. What's your plan to eliminate that? Yeah, not even just income tax because I've known people whose mortgage is paid off, but their property taxes have gone up and they can't afford to live in their same house. So taxes are really a big issue, even for retirees. I think in years past, that maybe wasn't the case. You know, if we talked to our grandparents, they didn't worry about taxes. Sure. But boy, today, we got to think about them. Amen to that. Well, Tammy, as always, it is great doing this with you. I really appreciate it. I saw there was a little bit of funness with YouTube and live stream. So thank you guys for your patience uh, as we went through this. We like the live pods. We want to get more of your feedback as this goes through. So shoot us that email at podcast at planyourfederalretirement.com. Leave us a comment in the YouTube channel. It would be great so we can hear from you. And what topics are you concerned about in retirement? Tammy and I love this stuff. We love to dive into detail. And until next time, happy planning. Hey, before you go, a few notes from our attorneys. Opinions expressed herein are solely those of Shalansky and Associates Incorporated, unless otherwise specifically cited. Material presented is believed to be from reliable sources, and no representations are made by our firm as to other parties' informational accuracy or completeness. All information or ideas provided should be discussed in detail with an advisor, accountant, or legal counsel prior to implementation content provided herein is for informational purposes only and should not be used or construed as investment advice or recommendation regarding the purchase or sale of any security. There is no guarantee that any forward-looking statements or opinions provided will prove to be correct. Securities investing involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. There is no assurance that any investment plan or strategy will be successful. 